Okay, welcome everybody. Another podcast from SilentEgor.com. We have a very, very special guest today, um, Dr. Gemma Newman, who basically is the plant power doctor. There's a message there, plant power, everybody. So we're going to get fit and well today. We're going to learn an awful lot about um, uh, Gemma's journey uh, as being a GP and now becoming an international superstar on plant power and the health benefits. So uh, without further ado, Gemma, welcome. Uh, thank you for attending this wonderful Monday morning and uh, looking forward to uh, hearing the story of how it all began. Thank you so much, Paul. It's a real honour to be here with you and your listeners this morning. And you're right, it's a gorgeous sunny day. And what a lovely introduction. Um, I don't think I've ever heard myself uh, referred to as an international superstar, so I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine, um, you're welcome. Yeah, so, yeah, so um, for any of your listeners who are not sure who I am, um, as Paul said, um, I'm the plant power doctor. I'm also a general practitioner. I'm a GP. I am a senior partner at a busy NHS GP surgery. I've got nearly 3,000 patients. That's my day job. Um, but I also have a tremendous interest, as has been alluded to, um, in holistic health and plant-based nutrition and how these things can really improve our well-being, prevent disease, in some cases even reverse disease. And that's why I was so passionate to share this message. And um, I'm really excited to talk to you today and also to share this with your listeners. So thank you for having me on. Very good. So obviously you've, um, you know, worked in that high paced NHS environment and still do, right? Um, what kind of flicked you from, you know, making those early moves to where you are now in relation to this this line of travel, which is very purposeful, isn't it, with you right now? This is a very heart-centric mission you're on. It's very clear with, you know, the great books that you, uh, you've you written and, you know, uh, you, you know the podcasts you've done. I mean, you, you, you're you a force out there right now with this prevention v. cure message. And... Um, and it's it's that association with nature as well, which which is truly amazing. I mean, just to share something with you. I mean, clearly, from from my background, um, I can totally empathise with where you are and how you've got to where you are. But I've worked in in commerce and in business for the last thirty years of working in um, high paced, high stress business environments, and it's been very interesting. And I'll share this about ten years ago. I was actively involved with leadership development and, and growing people to grow companies, call it that. And I was faced with a big problem, which brings me full circle to where we are today with yourself, Gemma, is we could develop the skills to perform within the business environment um, from an educational perspective and, you know, the codes of practice around performance and driving results. But to be candid with you, it was coming at a price. And... The message I was seeing was, you know, I was feeling was that we were manufacturing ill health in the workplace. And I know it's a big subject, but it, I knew it was ending up in the GP surgery. So, you know, with stress related illnesses and and the likes. And I saw that as a manufacturing, we we're manufacturing it. You know, and I was thinking we're actually ignorant of ourselves. And, I, you know, I don't want to be too controversial about it, but equally, you must have been seeing a similar thing at some point and then you know, this line of travel that you're you're following now, the greater good. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, this is it. I mean, I in my general practice, I see people suffering. I mean, especially perhaps in the last year with the pandemic and working from home, that's brought a whole other level of stress and anxiety for people. But certainly when it comes to working very long hours, being in a corporate environment, you know, stress and anxiety has been a huge factor for, for many of my patients. And you know, I knew that that they were going to be prone to long term diseases as time goes on. You know, there is a definite link between psychological stress and physical stress in the body. The mind body connection is very strong. And I, I realized very early on that we needed to try and address all of these factors if we were going to ever help people get back to health. And it's interesting. And what what's also you know, if we look at um, the kind, pardon the language, but the price of life in the sense of, you know, business and commerce is all about investment and, you know, results 
And one of the things that I, you know, similar to yourself, but, you know, obviously not practiced from a health and wellness perspective, I knew that the most important asset that you could ever consider investing in yourself was you, the human, you know, um, you know, I mean, we're all very much coming from that material society of, you know, it's all out there and, you know, I'm very much, uh, you know, the last 10 years, particularly been on a journey where that has its place, but not at any price. And I think that the biggest prize that you can ever honor yourself is this love and self care. And I think what I've also observed, Gemma, and you're endorsing it wonderfully, is, you know, different ways of actually educating ourselves, particularly from a health perspective, from a a prevention point of view. So with that in mind, I mean, you know, if you could kindly just sort of share some of the sort of some of those stories, that would be very, very interesting. I know that there was a a pivotal moment with your husband at one point, I believe, um, and helping him win a big marathon. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So looking back on my journey, it has had its various twists and turns, but I always felt that I wanted to try and approach sort of the whole you know where my patients were like what was missing and what what was causing them to become um, particularly unwell and so prior to my husband's story of running the London Marathon I I studied a bit of psychology solution focused therapeutic approaches cognitive behavioral therapy and I had this vague idea of course that nutrition was important you know eat your fruits and vegetables it kind of makes sense but I hadn't looked at it too deeply prior to that and as you mentioned, my husband ran the London Marathon and he was getting a lot of problems in his training. He was getting inflamed um, and injured quite frequently. And so he decided to try and look into what he could do to improve his training. Mm -hmm. And he looked at his running shoes. He looked at his technique, but he also looked at his diet. He looked at what he was putting inside his body, his fuel. And he thought to himself, well, if I'm really struggling to run a marathon distance, how is it that these guys that I admire can run ultra marathons, can run two or three marathons in a go. What are they doing different from what I'm doing? So he began to read uh, books like Rich Roll's book, Finding Ultra, uh, Brendan Brazier's Thrive, Scott Direct, Born to Run. And he realized that they were all plant based. And he thought, well, maybe I should give that a try and see if it has any results for me. And now he's not medical. He's not a doctor. He just wanted to get results. So he thought he would give it a go. And I was watching with curiosity and I suppose a healthy dose of skepticism. And (laughs) interestingly enough, he did really, really well. So at his next attempt running the London Marathon, he managed to achieve a time that was an hour and 10 minutes faster than his first attempt. And I was really blown away. I thought that is an incredible shift in his performance. And, you know, I myself am not somebody who's particularly into athleticism. I don't have a gym membership, but I do believe that movement is incredibly important. But also I wanted to find out, well, could these dietary benefits have an impact on my patients? Because what I'm interested in is preventing disease and hopefully improving, augmenting our pa- my patient's response to disease. So I thought, well, could it be helpful for heart disease? Could it be helpful for diabetes? Could it be helpful for skin issues, endometriosis, fibroids, um, wow. fertility? Like, where does where do we draw the line? And I began to do the research, and I I I was excited to discover that it could have some tremendous benefits for my patients. And so that was where the journey really began. Um, I myself had kind of come to an understanding that my genetic uh, cards were stacked against me because I had been on a sort of a fitness journey in my 20s. I had managed to uh, regain a lot of energy. I managed to lose some weight because when I started my practice, and I've been a doctor for a long time now, but when I first started, I wasn't looking after myself very well. I was eating a lot of, you know, takeouts from the doctor's mess and sweets on the wards. I just, you know, was doing the long shifts and I was absolutely exhausted. So at that stage, I had tried to improve my health through the conventional means, you know, you hear the usual things in society about or eat less carbs and, you know, simple calories in, calories out, exercise. So I did that and I got some initial results, but I ended up having a raised cholesterol and I had a family history, a strong family history of heart disease, um, early onset heart disease. And so when I checked my own cholesterol and saw that it was high, despite the fact that I was in optimal physical condition I thought well I've just got to accept my genetic fate 
Fast forward then to when I saw my husband's efforts and I read some of the data. I knew some of the environmental benefits of plant-based nutrition already. I think the science on that was very clear, but I hadn't actually researched the personal medical benefits until that time. And so when I decided to give it a go myself, I was sort of really astounded and excited to find that my own cholesterol panel, my lipid panel came back normal. And also the knee pains that I'd been getting intermittently when I was running for many years began to melt away. So I knew from a personal standpoint, well, this this is clearly doing something for my health as well, which was great. But the magic happened when I had the confidence to then share this with my patients and the wider world. And that's, as I say, there's so many stories I could share. It depends what, which disease state you want to talk about, but um, it's, it's really inspirational. It's fascinating. So I, I do like this line of travel because you're kind of, you know, you suffered at one end of the continuum. Now you've solved, you know, you're starting to solve major health problems through the power of, you know, plant-based diets. And, and it's not just that, is it? Because you've moved on in so many different ways. You're looking at different alternative therapies now and, um, you know, ways of it's just looking after yourself. I call it love, right? I mean, I think that, you know, we're all super educated in some respects. And I think the last 50 years and particularly the last 20 years, we've all lived these seriously high-paced business lives in one guise or another whether you're a gp in a busy surgery or you know you're running a corporate business but i think we've all neglected ourselves in in so many different ways and i think the pardon the language but the results are now just coming <laughs> coming out of you know we're now starting to think well actually there's got to be a different way um no matter what and it's 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 interesting to, to if i think it about it holistically you've You've had the message from somewhere, you know, your purpose is now really on a very different track. And you mentioned something quite interesting there that you, when you took the, you know, you found the confidence and the courage to kind of almost like say, I've been educated with all of this, but I've now just realized what, what my life's all about. Um, was that kind of like a profound moment that was coming to life and still is, I dare say? Yeah, it's an evolving moment, I think. You know, I come from a background where we have to be very clear that what we're telling patients and what we're sharing with patients is evidence based. Equally, I think that there is a certain knowing that comes from the heart. And so in my work, I try to combine the two. I try to combine that instinctive knowing. As you've rightly pointed out, we have to come from the heart centre. That's where we can truly get to understand ourselves, our own deep down, our own motivations, our own needs, wants and desires, but also uh, respect and love for our bodies. And, you know, we we have to do that if we're going to stay healthy throughout our lifetimes. And that's where plant based nutrition can come in. But it's also where thinking about, well, what other ways can I strategically improve my mental well-being? Am I sleeping right? Am I prioritizing my sleep? Am I moving my body? Am I prioritizing my relationships? Am I finding true purpose in the things that I'm doing in day-to-day -day life? And it doesn't have to be big things. You don't have to decide that you're going to, you know, change the world tomorrow. It's more about doing things in your life with purpose and making sure that you are consistent with your values as you go throughout your day. These are the things that will then hopefully have a knock-on effect to improving health um, longer term. It's interesting. I, I can reflect, you know, personally about, well, I live a ritual-based life, personally myself, you know, my four o'clock piece, I have a ritual, which my, my, I'm a caffeine drinker, so I do enjoy a great coffee and uh, and that's about as extreme as it gets. I don't, I mean, I don't drink alcohol and things like that. But the, the likes of the, uh, what I'm trying to say is I'm not perfect. However, I think there's so much you get back from that, which is you mentioned heart centric, um, pardon the language, heart centric insights and instincts um, that, you know, you have to listen to. And I think that sometimes we get to the point where we're at a tipping point where we have got you know, a diabetes problem or, you know, a cholesterol issue or, or, or whatever. And it's only then when sometimes it's just a little bit too late. However, I think, you know, from what I've picked up with um, plant power, it often can be reversed. So, for example, you can have an ailment of some description medically, and if you don't mind me using that term, that says your destiny is that way. However, there is some course correction that we can put you through and see what happens. So 
longevity, um, you know, rebalancing your life and realigning and redesigning. But it comes with that source intelligence to make these pivoting decisions to make this stuff happen, which is which is evident with with what you're, you're you know what you're doing and and, and advocating. Yeah, thank you. You're absolutely right. And these things, I, I wish more people knew about the power of of their actions and the power of their plate to help prevent and reverse disease. And for me, it's getting the right balance between helping people to empower themselves towards greater health, but also doing so with a sense of um, excitement and abundance. So, you know, it's a hard path to walk because... You know, sometimes in diet culture and wellness culture, there's this very there's this big emphasis on you have to do this. Otherwise, you know, it's your fault that you're not well or or, you know, you have to um, take this into your own hands. Otherwise, you know, what's wrong with you? Uh, equally, I think sometimes there's this attitude on the other end of the spectrum whereby you know, doctors especially can feel like, well, we know what's wrong with you. We know the label for what you've got. This is the medication. This is the procedure. This is the treatment. And that's all that you can do. And people on that end of the spectrum feel very much disempowered. So I think if we have the means and mentally, emotionally, financially, then it's fantastic to feel empowered to be able to make changes. And it doesn't actually require a big budget either. I think that's another important thing to say. Sometimes, you know, some of the people, some of your listeners may be, um, you know, on their entrepreneurial journey and may be struggling um, to make ends meet. And some of the cheapest foods known to man are, in fact, uh, plant based foods, whole foods. Um, and so, you know, with a little bit of ingenuity and uh, cookery skills, it's amazing what you can achieve. And as you've rightly said, it can have a tremendously powerful effect on our health. And this is not something, interestingly, that I'm saying as you know a lone maverick as it were it's just that most most healthcare professionals haven't really either read these particular guidelines or understood their significance so you know the american college of cardiology talks about the importance of plant-based approaches for preventing heart disease the american college of clinical endocrinology talks about plant-based approaches for preventing type 2 diabetes the world cancer research fund talks about fruits vegetables whole grains legumes as the cornerstone of a cancer preventing diet and so you know when we look at the overarching evidence we can see that that plants are definitely centre stage, but I think people have perhaps not really realised how important they can be for, for, for in some cases, even reversing certain conditions as well, which is just so powerful. It is, and I think I, I picked up a really nice message there. And, I, you know, obviously having operated, and you're quite right, a lot of our listeners uh, today will be from the, you know, the corporate environment. And we all know that is changing. A lot more people now are working from home, due to the sort of influences of the pandemic over the last sort of uh, year or so. And uh, here we go, you know, we're beyond the, the, the 12 month mark now. We're going into kind of year two. But I think people are genuinely starting to think a little bit more deeper about their, their wellness. And I think are now finding the space and the time to reflect uh, and realign. And I think, you know, with, with my business practices, I've got a business called Ego Stream, and it is about streaming the ego. It's not about building the ego and, and, and zengility.life, which is basically um, all about helping people realign their work lives in a, in a very different guise. But that word um, life needs to be used a lot more, I think, particularly in the, in the work world. And, and I think it's not a workforce anymore. It's a life force. And I think that that needs to, you know, and it's a metaphor to make a point, I suppose, or it's, you know, it's coinage to sort of reinforce our business leaders that are listening today, that we have a life force to lead and manage uh, in good order and not at any price. And unfortunately, due to the hedonism of the 20th century, which I believe is still a little bit overhung, it needs to realign and we need to start looking at ourselves from human beings and, you know, investing in ourselves from inside out. And this heart centered reflection is is critical. And then the you know, the, the, I suppose the question I have is and is get your physiology in good shape. You get your psychology in good shape. Is that right? Is that something that you would champion, Gemma? Yes, it is. I think sometimes sometimes it's hard because it makes sense instinctively that when someone is struggling uh, either with anxiety or depression 
um, that we try to fix it using psychological techniques. So, you know, you may go for counselling or CBT. Um, however, sometimes it's actually quite hard to deal with the root of the issue just through the brain, just through logic. We have to also deal with it through um, how our bodies respond to stimuli because we have to engage the parasympathetic nervous system if we're going to be able to switch on that rest and renew state. And you know, you talked about the frenetic nature sometimes of business where you know, many people feel that they're running on their sympathetic nervous system, their kind of fight or flight, which you know historically we would only have been in for very small bursts of time, but mm. we find ourselves in that state much more frequently. And so one of the most effective ways of switching state, switching to that parasympathetic nervous system, rest and renew and digest, is actually through the power of our physiology and the power of the breath and the power of nature and the power of um, movement. And, you know, I don't necessarily refer to the high intensity interval training that is really popular with many of us. Some people that will work really well. But if you find yourself in a high stress, high anxiety state, then then um, more parasympathetic driven exercise may be beneficial. Things like yoga or Pilates uh, or even things like uh, Qigong, um, other energetic therapies, because these are all ways that we can start to engage our parasympathetic nervous system. And the reason the breath is so fundamental to that is because it's available to us at all times, from the moment that we're born until the moment that we take our very last breath. That is a way that we can immediately reconnect with that side of our nervous system because it stimulates the vagus nerve, the wandering nerve, which goes all the way down through the body and is actually uh, very central to the way that the diaphragm functions, so that the base of the lungs. So if you can start to activate that vagus nerve, then you are immediately doing something that's beneficial for, for your physiology and your psychology. That's, that's a very well expressed, Gemma, I may say. But so for our listeners, there we go, oxygen. Um, let's have a little draw of oxygen and have a think. One, it's free. Two, it is life. And it's all about sustaining a very balanced mindset through so breath through breath and and the power of breath just slightly coming on to one of the big things that i uh, come up against from time to time is decision dysfunction so if we look at it from a from a life point of view a lot of people are reflecting right now and looking to change their life trajectory um through the influences of the pandemic as i say which you know are the blessing and the curse and the good and the bad, the yin and the yang. But equally, I think that one of the things that um, I'm championing right now is that we are in a very interesting transitory time with human existence. And I think that coming out from your perspective, I think it's fantastic, you know, fueling the body. Um, but, it, you know, being able to make good decisions, that's where I'm going with this. And I think a lot of people neglect decisions and I call it decision dysfunction as a kind of like a, a it needs to be tret <laughs> you know I, I uh, so doctor I have decision dysfunction how can you help me um it, it's an interesting one because it it creates apathy it, it all those classic sort of depression do I say and then you've got the influence of hormones you know and I you know I'm not a a specialist but I do know that you know, this has a big impact on, you know, people's performance, particularly, dare I say, it, in the early to mid point of life. Um, so a lot of my practice is with people between 45 and 60, as an example. And I always stress uh, the best is yet to come. And it's not about you know, your work life in the in the conventional sense, it's about fundamentally looking at yourself as the workforce and being able to sort of make better decisions. But clearly the the you know the influence of diet, nutrition, holistic um uh, lifestyles have huge benefits, which is which is very well expressed in in your material of recent Gemma with, you know, it's not just about the diet. There's other other rituals and routines that you champion really well. Yeah, thank you. I I, I appreciate that. And you are right, there are lots of different things that can uh, contribute to that. You mentioned sort of uh, decision. Um, what was the phrase you used? Decision. Dysfunction. Uh, dysfunction. Dis okay. 
And did you have a question for me around decision dysfunction? Why do I think people have Yes, or... I, th I think that's where I was going with that, yes. Hmm. So, I mean, there are so many reasons why we would struggle to make life decisions. And I think one of the other interesting points to make here is that we also live in a world that is absolutely chock-a-block full of distractions. You know, we have available to us at our fingertips at a moment's notice a way of distracting ourselves from uncomfortable decisions uncomfortable emotions but often it's the pain of discomfort that can then propel us forward into making new decisions into making new choices in our lives and that's something that we do instinctively shy away from because it's painful because it hurts but if we have the courage to come back to ourselves, come back to deep within, you know, what we feel is most important to us, what our values are, and actually sit with that discomfort, then we can move forward, move through it, and start to gain greater clarity about what it is that we're really looking for and what it is that we really want to achieve. So I think it's a way of kind of pushing through the discomfort in order to get to the point where we can make better decisions because we felt the pain of existing where we are right now. That's very insightful. I, I think it's, you know, having the courage to put yourself into that reflective stage of it's not positive, it's not negative, it just is. And I'm, you know, it's that sort of uh, interesting place. And I, I come back to one of the big, big points I have in life right now is we've all been paid to be positive somewhere on this journey. And sometimes that's not the answer. Um, you can't always be positive as an example. And I think you've expressed that slightly from a slightly different angle, that life is about from time to time putting yourself in those challenged states, I would say, uh, accepting that challenged state. And I think you mentioned it, you know, in your, in, in your, your book about meditation. Um, you know, I know I said it's a big, it's all, you know, everybody talks about meditation right now, but I think it's a very powerful thing is, you know, creating that sort of introspection of um, uh, thought and thinking things through and then linking that back to heart-centric and gut intelligence. And I know that's another subject that we can talk for two years about, but these are things that it comes back to time, choice, accessing, learning a lot more about ourselves as what I call life force, which is it's within you don't need to look too far out. It all sits here. So uh, there's many aspects of learning about ourselves. And I think that your message is loud and clear that you're bringing it from a multi multiple perspectives, which is, which is, which, which also pulls off the point of what you mentioned very early on in, in our conversation, um, the whole, you know, that it's, it's not just one thing, it's many coming together. It's that unity of, of components, uh, to help us make these better life life decisions. So in, interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And I should probably say, just in case your listeners um, are interested, I have written about the power of meditation, um, but it's not in my Plant Power Doctor book. The Plant Power Doctor book is all about the power of uh, nutrition. Um, and it's kind of like a one-stop shop for that. So I talk about different diseases, heart health, cancer skin health plant-based eating for all ages gut health immune health and then i talk about how to do it and then i share 60 delicious recipes so that's more food focused if any of your listeners are thinking right well i'm going to get that book to learn about meditation i don't want you to be disappointed yeah no no i get it <laughs> but, i get it i think it's uh I'm about meditation and i do agree it's really it's, it, it can be an incredibly important tool um but for those of you who are uncomfortable with meditation, for those of you who've, who've tried it and felt that it didn't work for you, I think start out with the breath just to begin with um, and just go outside, be in nature, breathe. And then when you feel perhaps that that's more comfortable for you, then start with, you know, just really slowly, 30 seconds, just one minute. Um, and you'd be amazed at how powerful that can be, even in and of itself. Uh, over the course of time I think that's the thing is you don't necessarily immediately think wow with the breath you begin to immediately feel better but with meditation it's a harder one because we tend to build habits through um, positive repetition but with meditation it can feel like it takes slightly longer to reap those rewards um, so 
Now, I thought I'd just add that as well, because there are many people who have heard that meditation is good and may have tried it, but found that it didn't really work for them. So Mm. I thought I would I would just share that that sometimes you can get um, benefits if you think a bit more of a long term goal. Yeah, no, it's it's very insightful. And um, thanks for sharing that. That's uh, that's really good. So just sort of leading up to sort of two things I just want to kind of cover off on here. What's your view on hormones and balancing hormones in in, in, you know, the physiology of the human. It's something that never gets really talked too much about. Is that something you can share any light on? So that's the first sort of area I'd just like to cover off. And set, and, and, and really talk a little bit about um, uh, sleep and pre, pre-bed rituals and routines, you know, from a nutrition perspective. It might be beneficial because I meet a lot of execs candidly that really are challenged with sleep and if they could only sleep better they perform an awful lot better from wake you know mood whatever but any any guidance on those two areas that we can just zero in on let me try and zero in on this quickly um i do have a chapter on hormonal health in the book which i think is really important it's not just for women may i say yes i talk about endometriosis i talk about fibroids i talk about perimenopause menopause but i also talk about uh, male hormones um, sperm counts fertility um erectile health and you know there are many things that can actually sort of um, tie into hormonal balance Uh, Our bodies do a tremendous job. We we have this thermostat in the brain, which helps us to produce the right amount of hormones in different parts of our bodies, depending on what we need. But sometimes these things can go out of balance. And it's my belief, um, based on the literature that I've read and based on my own experience, that if we can fuel our bodies in a way that's beneficial, that gives our bodies those right building blocks, then it's easier for our bodies to rebalance our hormones in the best way that serves us well. I think that there are natural times in our life cycle where certain hormones will fluctuate and you know there is an ebb and flow to that, especially for women as you're coming up to the menopause, where we have a, a sort of a, a sharp drop in estrogen levels. And for men too, testosterone levels will start to diminish much more slowly. So you're, as, a, as a male, you're less likely to feel that effect um, so dramatically, but it is still there as a slow decline. And with nutrition, what you're doing is you're able to, in a sense, level out those ebbs and flows a little bit more neatly. So um, I found that you know with plant-based nutrition, you actually notice um, that you have more of a potential steady flow of 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 estrogen coming up to the menopause say for example it's interesting because when you look at people from cultures where they have um generally fairly whole food rich um uh diets plant rich diets places such as japan for example there isn't really a word for menopause women don't necessarily suffer from the hot flushes discomfort that people in the western world will get and um it's thought to be partially due to the uh, fact that they they have a lot more unprocessed soy products in their diet so tofu tempeh uh, edamame beans miso paste um you know they use those for cooking um it, there's a lot more whole foods plant foods um and you know fish things like that and it's just a way of um being able to gradually balance the amount of hormones that you're losing over time um Plant foods have less in the way of, well, clearly they they have far less in the way of um, estrogens, whereas if you're looking at meat and dairy, especially dairy, it contains a mammalian equivalent estrogen. So you're drinking you're drinking the milk from a pregnant mammal, wow. <laughs> which will contain a certain amount of estrogenic hormones, which I think does have its role to play in, in how your body is going to take on that um, for its nutrition. So yeah, I think that there's a definite role to play for uh, nutrition in balancing hormones. But it's again, I don't want to sort of say that it will it will do everything. It's not a panacea. You know, we have to look at all the aspects of our life and a lifestyle. And sometimes medications will, of course, be um, important and necessary. But yeah, it's it's good to have an insight into that. And as I said, there's a whole chapter on it. I won't. I won't go into a, a big monologue, but um, it can play a big role. We've just learned something. It's the Japanese diet. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and I totally understand. Well, they also do forest bathing as well, don't they? Which is just lovely. Yeah, absolutely. So 
just for our listeners, as we sort of like step, you know, start to look towards concluding our really high paced but highly factual council this morning on on health and wellness, it's uh, it's 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 been fascinating. The bedtime routine that you would champion for people that are challenged with sleep. What what would your kind of a, a few tips. tips? Yeah. I think my top tips would have to diverge depending on the kind of person that you are. So there are, there's the kind of person who um, really struggles with sleep and there's a kind of person who doesn't prioritise sleep. Right. If you're the kind of person that is aware that sleep is important but doesn't really pay it much attention, then the main message here is to prioritise your sleep. So make sure that you perhaps think about going to bed an hour earlier than you would have otherwise intended. Do you really need to watch that extra episode on, of your favourite show on Netflix? Maybe not. Go to bed. Job done. There's a proportion of people who really, really struggle to sleep and they will have tried all manner of things to get to sleep. And so chances are they may have already tried the basic things like um, turning your lights down low, getting yourself a nice routine, chamomile tea, lavender on your pillow, eye mask, you know, um, Many people will have already tried those things if they are struggling, if they are struggling with insomnia. And so for those people, it's it's actually, I would say that probably my top tip is to come to an acceptance of what's going on with your sleep patterns. Now, that sounds like an odd thing to say, but sometimes we can really become obsessed with the fact that we're staying awake when we don't want to be awake and it can really increase our stress hormones. Right. Cortisol. <laughs> so what you don't want to do is get stressed about the fact that you're still awake when you wish you were asleep and clock watch and get frustrated and then get your mind working through all the things that you should, that you have to do the next day and all the things that you wish that you could do better if only you'd got that night's sleep. So First tip for somebody who really struggles is to come to a place of acceptance that your sleep pattern is not where you want it to be, but that that's okay. Try to maintain a really consistent uh, timings. So even when you have struggled to get to sleep at night, try to go to bed at the same time the next night. Even when you have struggled because you are absolutely exhausted the next day and you want to lie in, try to consistently wake up at the same time and if you do that it begins to help your circadian rhythm a lot better another tip that some of your listeners might not know is to go outside fairly soon after you've woken up because assuming that it's light of course looking up into the sky immediately on waking is a great way of stimulating um, serotonin production in the body wow. which 12 hours later it's converted to melatonin, which then helps you begin to get your sleep cycle sorted. So early morning light, it doesn't have to be sunny. It could be a miserable rainy day. If you put your eyes up towards the light, those photons of light will have an impact on your hormone production. And you can start to feel um, that you're getting your, your, um, your circadian rhythm in check. For those of you who are keen coffee drinkers, I would potentially suggest maybe limiting the caffeine after midday uh, based on the half-life of caffeine in the body. Some people don't feel the effect as much as others, but it can definitely affect your sleep pattern, even if you're not aware of that. Um, blue light blocking glasses can be helpful. Certainly mentally switching off from work is a big one. So um, perhaps creating some boundaries with your work-life balance, uh, making yourself a um, an out of office response <laughs> because some people will be expected to respond to emails up until 10 11 o'clock at night and i think it's important to try to create those boundaries wherever possible um there's actually a really great podcast that i did with two sleep experts um dr guy meadows who runs his own sleep clinic and um uh, Mrs. Ramlakan, I can't remember her first name at the moment, it's, it's escaped me, but uh, the Holland and Barrett, the Wellness Edit podcast was a fantastic masterclass, 45 minutes with these two sleep experts. And if you haven't learned enough from this one, then you can check that one out and you'll get plenty more tips and advice from them. Well, it's very kind of you to share that intelligence, Gemma. And um, may I say, I mean, basically, you know, just, just wrapping very positively, I think it's been a uh, a tonic today listening to this. I mean, I've got three or four key things out, out of this. And I hope our listeners are, are sort of um, impressed with the uh, the intelligence of 
how we can start to realign and redesign our lives from inside out and start to think about um, diet improvement and just techniques that will give us more completion in ourselves and, and a feeling of general well-being without going out, um, dare I say it, and, and spending too much money uh, because uh, it's there for a purpose. But equally, I've always believed that the gold sits within. We just need to learn how to activate mm. it, which is which is very good. But uh, I'd like to sort of draw our, our, our podcast to a kind of conclusion, Gemma. But once again, the word is what a tonic for a Monday morning. Um, listening to uh, you. you, you're an expert. It's very clear and um, highly informative. And uh, it's a pleasure to talk to, you know, a doctor, an entrepreneur. Um, good luck with the future. Let's stay close, but not that close. And, um, you know, hopefully... Uh, We've all got something from it. So a big thank you. Oh, you're more than welcome. It was an absolute pleasure. And for anybody who wants to look at additional resources, I've got loads of free information on my website as well, gemmanewman.com. Brilliant. Thank you so much. <laughs>